Please do. Okay. Start? Yes, please. Um, so, the article um, I'll be presenting today is called The Defining Status of International Law in Israel's Supreme Court Decision Regarding the Occupied Territories. And it's basically presenting a relatively simple thesis. And um, the simple thesis, the article um, is uh, that I want to put forward is that in the last decade, and in particular in the last five years, there's been a decline in the status of international law, in case law regarding the occupied territories, in particular case law that deals with law of occupation, that um, this decline is associated to some extent with the retirement of former Chief Justice Barak, but not exclusively, and that as a result, the current um, discourse, judicial discourse, regarding the occupied territories in the Supreme Court decisions in the, in the current Supreme Court case law is becoming more and more similar to the public discourse regarding the occupied territories, which basically treats the territories to a large extent as if they were part of Israel. Um, and I ask two questions um, in this paper. The first is, how can we, what is the explanation um, for this shift? for this decline, for this change in the status of international law of occupation. And the second reason is, the second question is whether problematic. Why should we care about, um, about this change? Now, the article basically com compares two decades. The first decade is the first decade is decade between the mid 1990s and the mid 2000s, um, a decade that others have referred to as the golden age of international law in the decisions of the Supreme Court. Daphne Barak Ares published an article um, referring to what she called the new jurisprudence inspired by um, international law. Uh, Juan Barak published a lot. Um, academic writings, uh, uh, analyzing and examining the extent to which the Supreme Court relied on international law during that decade. And indeed, if you look in the decisions of the Supreme Court of Israel during this past decade, during the past decade, the previous decade, you see very long analysis, very long referrals, um, and analysis of international law um, issues. And the example, um, maybe the paradigmatic example, um, for this kind of jurisprudence is the case of Maraba versus um, the Prime Minister of Israel, which deals with um, the legality of um, the legality of the wall, the legality of the fence. And the case of Maraba was delivered after the ICJ delivered its um, advisory opinion on the legality of the wall. Now, the issue of the wall was previously already discussed in the Israeli Supreme Court in the case of Metzrik. And in Metzrik, the Supreme Court already, already accepted the state's, um, the state's uh, claim that the purpose for building the fence was a security purpose, basically analyzed the issue under, um, under the law of occupation and concluded that since this was a permitted cause, the reason for which the fence was built was a permitted reason, the only question that still had to be determined was a proportionality question, and this was going to be examined with, um, with with regard to different segments of the fence. Of the fence. So each part of the wall, fence the wall, fence we talk on who's, who's writing the theme, but each part um, of the wall will be examined separately and proportionality analysis will basically be applied to each segment and each part separately. So from a purely Israeli law perspective, the issue of the legality of the wall was already <coughs> settled when the ICG, ICJ's opinion um, was, or when the ICJ, when the advisory opinion was delivered. Um, and as we know, the advisory opinion is an advisory opinion. It's not binding even under international law. Of course, it's still very significant, but it's not legally binding. And from an Israeli law perspective, it's definitely not binding. It has no binding status from an internal domestic law perspective. So if we're talking from a purely legal perspective, there was really no need for the Supreme Court to refer to the ICJ decision or analyze the ICJ decision the question of the legality of the wall is a question that was already settled at this phase from an Israeli domestic law perspective. Now, despite this, um, the Maraba decision is basically a very long analysis of the ICJ, um, ICJ's advisory opinion. And if you read this decision, 
It's basically a decision that is written for an external crowd. And if you read this decision, then that Marabah decision is a response to the ICJ's advisory opinion. And what Justice Barak tries to do in this opinion is to minimize the, 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 the friction between the, internet, the, between the international court and between the Israeli Supreme Court. And he says the following and very interesting and paragraph, he says the basic normative foundation upon which the ICJ and the Supreme Court in the Betsuri case based their decision was a common one. They held, the ICJ held that Israel holds the, Israel hold the West Bank uh, pursuant to the law of belligerent occupation. This is also our legal view. That we have the same opinion. The ICJ held that an occupier state is not permitted to annex the occupied territory. That's also our perception. The ICJ held that in the occupied territory, the occupier state might, must act according to the Hague Convention and the Geneva Convention. We have the same opinion. So basically, this whole um, analysis, right, this whole reasoning is trying to point at the gap between the ICJ and the Israeli Supreme Court is actually not that great. So what's the difference? Well, here Dr. Barak says, well, actually, the only difference is in, in, about evidence. We have evidence indicating that there were real security issues at stake, and they didn't have these evidence. And basically, the implicit thing he's saying, the implicit claim is, is that if the ICJ had the same type of evidence the Israeli Supreme Court has, they would rule the same thing. Because from a legal normative perspective, they hold the same views. Now, this is obviously not the case. You need to take a quick look at the ICJ opinion to see that the legal analysis is completely different. The ICJ integrates into the analysis the question of the settlements, determines that the settlements is illegal, and therefore the wall, which is a wall which is aims at protecting the settlements, is also illegal. And the ICJ includes a use of force analysis, which is completely lacking from the Israeli Supreme Court, of course. So this is, this is not portray a real picture of the difference between two decisions. Now that's pretty obvious, but I think it's an interesting question is who is this written for? And this is, from a legal perspective, this is not necessary. From the perspective of the Israeli public opinion, well, it's fair to say, public opinion polls validate this, that the Israeli public doesn't really care about the ICJ opinion, and that there's this certain extent hostility in the Israel society towards the ICJ anyway. So the question is, who is this aimed to? And I think that here, the answer is that this is a decision that is written for an external audience. This is not, re this is not written for an Israeli domestic audience. This is not a purely legal decision. This is an outward-facing opinion, which is written for an international audience, and in particular for an international judicial audience. Right, what Schachtel calls an invisible collage of international lawyers, with what, or, or uh, the global community of courts, global community of tort. And this is really for this crowd within an internal dialogue um, that is taking place within um, this judicial community. Now, when we examine decisions of the Israeli Supreme Court that regard the occupied territories and basically are under law of occupation from the mid-2004 forward. It is very difficult to find these types of analysis, very long and elaborate um, analysis and explanation and investigations of the law of occupation. And instead, we find substitution some extent of the law of occupation with regard to issues and questions that arise in the occupied territories with Israeli law. And what I claim um, in the paper is that basically the court employs three different um, tactics, three different ways which work together um, in current case law, which shifts the focus of the international, of the court, of the Supreme of the Israeli Supreme Court regarding the occupied territories. And before I look into these different tactics in a different way, I think it's important to say that from a very, from a formal legal perspective, the legal framework that applies to the territories hasn't changed yet. We might be witnessing this change soon, but at least for now, it hasn't changed. So when we ask what is formally the legal framework <coughs> that applies to the occupied territories, the answer remains the same, right? Israel looks the law of Israel applies without explicitly discussing the status of the territories, has basically agreed to the application of the law of belligerent occupation. 
Court operate the Hague Convention, dispute regarding the, 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 the relevant application of the Geneva Convention, but in general, we're working under the same legal framework that we've known since uh, for, the, for the past 15, 51 years. However, if we look deeper into the cases, we see that the attention, that's the word, the attention of the court or the focus of the court um, has changed, and I think this is basically what we need, or this is basically what we need to be looking at. So the shift is more subtle. It's not about changing um, the entire legal framework, but rather about a generally skeptic approach towards the ability of international law to provide a solution to questions and problems that arise in the occupied territories to a growing willingness to refer to other sources court has long referred to, to, to Israeli administrative law, but now in recent years it's also referring to Israeli constitutional law as a source that is more relevant um, for dealing with specific problems that arise or issues that arise in the, um, in, the art, in, in the occupied territories. And I think this is the shift that, um, that, we, are looking, that we are looking into that we are seeing. Are you arguing that there's also a change in the substantive outcomes? Are decisions today more likely to be inconsistent with international law? Or is it just a matter of citing the, the law that is cited in the decisions? I think that's a good question. So here's a question. I didn't focus on outcomes. Okay. Uh, because, and I, I started focusing on the <coughs> outcomes, but I think that for various reasons, the cases have changed so much that it's very difficult to decide about, to, to look at the, the outcomes. I think that my focus here is mostly on reason. Um, and I think, and if, well, that's the last one, I think that it still matters. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the second part of my answer. I focus mostly on reasoning, not necessarily on outcome. And um, because we've seen in the previous decade also that the court has applied very imaginative and very creative interpretation of international law to apply international law and yet allow the state Okay, to, to do certain, to certain things. So I'm not sure this is so much about, about the results, but it is about the outcome, but it is about reason. I mean, I think, and, I, um, and I'll go back to that point, I say, why, why does it matter? If the court has interpreted international law in a creative way that allows the state to do what it wants, then right, why, why do we care if it allows the state to do what it wants to do through the prism of international law or through the prism of constitutional law? And I think it does, it, 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 it does matter. And we should get, even if um, it's a reasoning issue or not so much a result issue. But two more minutes. I just want to show the, the examples. So basically, um, my point is that uh, I want to show three very quick examples, very short examples, uh, that illustrate this, this, the shift or the direction that the court is going to. And the first one, first tactic, or the first, uh, the first example, looks at is the um, tendency of the court to start, and we see this more and more, to treat the Israeli occupation as a unique situation um, to which regular rules don't apply, regular law of occupation don't apply, don't apply, and um, to turn, rely, and quote more often this notion of a prolonged occupation, saying it is a prolonged occupation, but they use the notion of a prolonged occupation not to hold the state to stricter duties. Because if it's a prolonged occupation, you could say, well, this is basically the sovereign, and you know, these people are living on, under occupation for a longer period of time, so we should apply more duty, hold, hold the, the occupying state to stricter standards. Instead, they're using the notion of prolonged occupation to allow um, state to do things which it shouldn't be allowed or wouldn't be allowed to do under an occupation that is not a prolonged occupation. And I think the paradigmatic example here is the case of Yeshdin, um, which is a case that concerns um, the operation of uh, queries in the, in the West Bank and whether the state can use, uh, to what extent the state can use basically what products of, of the queries. And here, the court basically turns Article 43 on its head, stating that because this is a prolonged occupation, the occupying state should be allowed to do more than it's allowed to do in a regular occupation, which is not a, a, 
prolonged occupation. The um, exact quote is, the belligerent occupation of Israel in the area has some unique characteristics, primarily the donation, the duration of the occupation periods that required adjustments of the law to the reality on the ground. And therefore, um, the court concludes that considering this state of affair, it is therefore difficult to accept the, the petitioner's decisive assertion, according to which the querying operations are in no way promoting the best interest of the area. So when Article 43 says the occupying power can work, can, is basically allowed to, to take action that is necessary to promote the interest of the area, here they've turned this into the default. <coughs> now they have to show you cannot claim that using the operating the queries in no way promotes the interest of the area, rather than having to prove that it actually promotes it. So this is the, the basically change the different rule. And the reason why they did so is, well, basically the interests here are mixed of Israelis and Palestinians. You can't really separate the two due to the prolonged nature of the occupation. The second thing which we see in um, recent case law is the refusal of the court to review changes in international law. So the health demolition cases are actually um, a good example in this regard. Basically, basically, basically the Supreme Court has ruled in the late 70s, early 1980s that house demolitions are, are permitted under international law under a very original interpretation of international law. Despite the fact that there has been really extensive analysis and writing of regarding this issue, the court has consistently refused to re-examine the original basic question of the compatibility of house demolitions with international law, despite the change in international law despite the involvement of international criminal law, which even if they do not apply directly to these cases that come to the court, they do make very clear what kind, to, what, to what extent certain norms are considered as prohibited um, under, international, under international law. And despite of all of these developments, the court has relied on these old cases Refusing to re to open the question, although we see that in other areas of law, of course, it's very willing to go back and re-examine questions um, that have been decided such a long time ago. The third now, once the court has minimized its reliance on international law, either by saying, "Well, international law is not relevant to this particular situation of Israel," or international law. Skip, skip an example, skip one example, it's not relevant, it hasn't developed enough to deal with contemporary needs on the war on terror or security issues, it's just not there yet, or by saying, yeah, we've looked into international law in the past, we really don't see, when there's, when, agree that there's an issue here, for example, in the health demolitions, a human rights issue, but we don't think that this is necessarily an international law issue, so we're not going to go back to the essential basic international law uh, questions. Once the court has, um, has by these kind of analysis, has used these kind of argument, this kind of reasoning, then it needs to find some alternative framework when violations, when questions that involve violations of rights, of rights do come up in the court. And maybe the strongest example here, it's not the only one, let's talk a little bit about also in a minute about other examples. Maybe the strong example, strongest example here is the examples of how demolitions. And here I don't want to talk about actually the judges that, um, the, the majority judges, but actually about minority judges, judges that consistent, consistently express discomfort with health demolitions, understand that there's some, that there's a pro problem with health demolitions from a human rights perspective and a serious problem with human rights perspective, and still prefer to address that problem not through the prism of international law, although the legal framework hasn't changed in terms of law of occupation that applies in you know the legal framework is still the same, but instead they choose to say, well, maybe the way to approach this is not through um, international law, but is actually through Israeli constitutional law. So in quite a few of the health demolition cases, we see judges saying, well. It should be recalled that we should interpret or, or use, apply 
uh, regulation 119, which is the regulation that allows under which how demolitions are performed, should be used uh, with caution and interpreted in the context of basic law, human dignity and liberty. Now, this is a very odd determination that the court really doesn't supply, doesn't provide any reasoning for. Why would basic law, human dignity and liberty apply to an act that is performed by the state in the occupied territories? The court has since the 1970s already applied Israeli administrative law, but there it had very clear rationale. Of course, as well, this is an arm of the of the, of the executive army, an arm of the executive branch. International law of occupation is the legal framework, but within this international law of occupation, this legal framework, when we have particular acts, we know international administrative law still applies. But the court has not applied the basic laws or Israeli constitutional law. And to the occupied territories. And in some decisions, in a few decisions in the recent years, it has done so without really providing an explanation for why it chooses to do so. And perhaps an even I think, more important question that arises here, well, if the court is looking for a human rights framework to apply, if the court believes that the answer is not under international law, under the law of occupation, either because it doesn't provide an answer or because it actually there's no problem how the militias under the law of occupation, which has been the official, um, the official uh, position um, of, of the state, which the court has not really done. But if the court is actually seeking a human rights framework, why not go to international human rights? Right? If we have to choose between two alternative human rights frameworks to apply to a case or an issue that arises in the occupied territories, why turn to Israeli constitutional law that occupying the state's internal domestic law and apply it to these acts rather than to international law, international human rights law. And here, of course, there are also answers, possible answers. One answer is that, well, the state objects to the application of international human rights law to its territories, so the court really hasn't ruled one way or the other um, with respect to these questions. But there's no real answer or no real um, uh, explanation um, for, the, for the, um, this application. Now, how can this be explained, and why does this matter? And this is where um, this is where I'm going going to end. I think that part of the explanation is probably personal. Some judges are more interested with inter international law; they're more familiar with international law; they're more inclined to apply international law, and therefore we can expect to see more international law in their decision. But this is only partial explanation because there are other cases in the Israeli Supreme Court not cases that regard the occupied territories, for example, cases that regard as asylum workers, <coughs> in which there's actually quite an elaborate discussion about inter international law in current case law as well. So it's not about judges that know or like or don't like international law. That's too simple um, of an answer. I think the more um, interesting or more accurate response and the more accurate explanation regards the question, how do you frame these issues. How do you frame the issue of Israel's actions in the occupied territories? What is permitted to do? What Israel is permitted to do in the occupied territory? How it runs the territory? And here, I think there's a big difference between a court that's outward facing, that sees itself as part of an international community, and to a large extent it adopts or adapts to the international dialogue discourse regarding the occupied territory, and a court that sees itself primarily as a domestic institution, and it adapts to Israel's domestic internal legal discourse regarding the occupied territories. And the dominant discourse in Israel today is political discourse, is that whatever whatever one, one believes should be the result or the, the, the solution or the and story of the territory, this is an internal Israeli question. It's something for Israel to decide on its own. We've seen this as very, you know, NGOs that, that, that operate in the territories, they're labeled as illegitimately intervening in Israel's internal business. So the internal political discourse to a very to a large extent treats already treat already treats is the territories and all the questions that we've got the territory. But if it was an internal Israel issue, we could dispute it, but it's our problem. It's not something that the international community has or should have. Now the question is, why does this matter? 
I mean, if the result, here, going back to your question, if the outcome is basically the same outcome, mm -hmm. and if the court legitimized health demolitions there, and to a large extent still legitimizing health demolitions now, and if it provides that the state, the, the um, if it provides the state the same kind of leeway that it did <coughs> under constitutional law, under domestic law, that it did under international law, then maybe it's actually a good thing that it's not applying international law. Maybe we don't need this facade. Maybe we don't need this, this game of supposedly applying international law of occupation, but actually interpreting it in a unique Israeli way that allows the state to do most of what it wants to do. Why do you need this? And I think that it is a problem, because it's not a problem from a legal perspective, purely legal perspective. But I think that it's, it's, there's a problem here of reinforcing the current political discourse. So by responding to the current political discourse and trying to speak the language of the political courses, this, this part to a large extent legitimizes it. Um, and it's basically, I don't think this is intentional, but it's basically, I think, contributing to those who attempt to frame the question of the future of the territories as an internal Israeli question. And it also contributes to the alienation towards international, towards, towards the international community, towards the world. It reinforces this perception that says that international law and the opinion of the international community is not something that needs to be taken into consideration. This is to a large extent in line with public opinion polls. There are a lot of the public opinion polls um, conducted, for example, by the Israeli Democracy Institute. They demonstrate that the public in general doesn't think, um, doesn't feel that the opinion of the international community should be a constraint when handling security threat or something that should be taken into consideration. And so this kind of has a kind of reinforcing effect. Now it also affects the legal, um, the legal debate, because if the court is not going to decide these issues based on international law, but rather it's going to shift its analysis to the Israeli domestic law, constitutional law. And even if it's going to take constitutional law very seriously and apply these te the constitutional test very rigidly and strictly, then basically petitioners lose the incentive to make international law arguments and bring them to the court. Because the idea is that they want to focus their attempts on the arguments that work. So this kind of shifts, it affects the entire legal ecosystem, right? If the court doesn't take certain, doesn't refer to, doesn't apply certain arguments, or doesn't, or stays away from a certain framework, then petitioners have no really incentive to make these arguments. And the whole discourse shifts in a way that might be very difficult um, to shift back. Now, I think to a large extent, kind of test case is still ahead of us. Um, and the test case that is, is still ahead, and there have been since, since I wrote the article, I think there have actually been a few cases that need to be in the article that strengthen the, the claim that this is the way things are going. But I think the, the most important test case is probably the judicial review of the settlement regularization law. Um, because when the, the petitions that were fell to the court against the settlement regularization law, they basically have two parts. One part is uh, one, two components. One part is an international law component, saying that <coughs> the Knesset can't even legislate this law because it's not a sovereign in the occupied territories. And then from an international law perspective, this is a law that, um, that was legislated without authority. This is an international law issue. The second component is a constitutional law component, saying, well, if we examine the constitutionality of the settlement realization law under human dignity, under basic law, human dignity and liberty, well, we find that it violates the right to property and the right to equality, and probably you know, it's disproportional, and the law will be invalidated. Now, although in 2017-18, if you learned anything, is not to make predictions, election. I think it's pretty fair to say that um, it's not unlikely that the, um, that the law will be invalidated, which means that it is likely that the law will be invalidated. Um, but I also think that it is pretty likely that the more dominant component will be the constitutional law component, uh, the constitutional law reading, primarily because 
in constitutional review in Israel, this is the way in which you invalidate laws, right? Through, this is the regular way to invalidate law through constitutional law, and the, the constitutional route, route and not through international law uh, route. And I think that and, and for for a large extent, for the initiators of the law, this is a win-win situation. Because even if the law is invalidated, the discourse has already shifted. Right? It means that, well, when the court, the state acts in the occupied territories, the test we go to is not in the place we go to to examine the legality of these actions is not international law, but international law of occupation, but constitutional law. And with constitutional law, it's a balancing test. We've seen it in the asylum seekers. So this particular version of the law might not be proportional. But once we've entered into this kind of constitutional analysis already, then five years from now, then we could offer a slightly different balance to similar ideas. And we're already under a constitutional law proportionality analysis, and international law is already not an important part of the discussion. And I think that eventually, even at this point in time, the outcome is the same. Down the road, the leeway the state has under constitutional law analysis is a much larger, is a much wider. Leeway. So I think it doesn't it won't necessarily affect the outcome now, but it will affect outcomes in um, other cases. Yeah. Um, how about looking at the positive aspect or some positive implications of this trend? Can, can you argue that greater reliance on Israel law increases the legitimacy of the decisions because it's our law, it's not some foreign law? UN conventions. Yeah, it is. So the decisions are often more legitimate because they apply Israel. Yeah, that's what I, I agree. I think that's, that's exactly the point I explicitly make in the article. I say the reason the court adopts adapts yeah. the domestic discourse is because it wants it legitimate. It wants to attain legitimacy within the domestic crowd. Well, previous courts, and especially Justice Barack, he also cared about legitimacy among his peers. The decisions among his peers in an international crowd. So I think there is that effect of legitimizing the thing, and that is the upside. I think that it goes both ways. I mean, I think that I think that at a certain point, this is a very delicate game, right? Because I've written about this in another point in the actual comparative context. When courts are under attack, and in a climate in which there's political attacks on the court. We see not only in Israel, but also in other countries, that of course we track from international law and they turn to domestic law. And they do that because of the legitimacy, right? Their legitimacy is undermined anyway. So I think it's very natural for them to turn to, 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 to domestic law, which is more legitimate, not just sociologically more legitimate, but actually normatively really more legitimate, not in the case of the occupation, but in other cases. And, uh, and to do and, and, and to protect human rights, to, to, to deal with it, to, to handle these kinds of questions. But I think that once court doing that, they may it may have positive effects in the short term. But they're actually losing an important set, an important source in the long term. Because domestic law is controlled yeah. by domestic legislators. And if we look at other countries, in completely different contexts, this, not contexts like Israel or occupation, but if we look at Hungary or Poland or these kind of countries, and what happens in these countries eventually is that well, courts turn rely prefer to rely on domestic law rather than on international law, and then the legislative, the parliament is occupied by very nationalistic, right, in certain um, parties, and they change the domestic law and they make enact constitutional changes not just legislation changes, and then to go back and say, well, actually, we still have international law we can turn to once the court has itself contributed to the delegitimization of international law, it's very different to do so. So I think, yes, in the short term, there, there are positive, uh, positive uh, effect is that decisions might be considered more legitimate. I think that's exactly the reason the court is turning to domestic law, but there is a price in the long run. Um, for this case. They could, they could, there are actually, actually could be stronger plans. You could say, well, what if the laws provided under constitutional law, the protection provider are, provided under constitutional law are actually better? Right? That's also a fair claim to say, if we look at a particular case, the protections offered by constitutional law 
are actually stronger than the protections offered by the law of occupation. So basically, actually, you know, land, land, we're turn, we're, we're doing the residents of occupied territory a favor that we're enacting our laws upon. And in certain concrete situations, that might actually be true. You know, from a, from the from the to look at you know which laws better, which protections are actually stronger. But in these examples, they're not. And I, I discuss in the article why they're not. Why I don't think that this is the case. Um, so theoretically, that could be the case. But there is a reason why law of occupation is supposed to apply to an occupied territory and not the domestic law of the occupied country. And I think that here, from a normative perspective, it's also very difficult to, uh, to justify the application of constitutional law rather than international human rights law. Right, the state has consistently, Israel has consistently objected to the application of international human rights law in the territories. Israel has always claimed that um, against the parallel application of international human rights law and international law of occupation, of, of international and law of belligerent occupation, arguing that it's either or. And the court has applied norms from international human rights law to the territories, although it has not explicitly ruled on the application of them, except for in the Malta case. Where the court says, well, we're like the ICJ, so if they apply, we basically agree. But other than in the Malibu place, I've been rather vague about the application of international human rights norms to the territories. But in these cases, when the court applies international, when the court applies Israeli constitutional law, then I mean, it begs the answer. If you're looking for human rights norms, why aren't you applying international human rights norms? To an occupied territory rather than constitutional, Israeli constitutional human rights norms. They're the same norms from a substantive perspective. They're the same rights. What possible justification can there be other than annexing territory to apply your domestic human rights law, which is constitutional law, rather than the alternative of international human rights law? And there's no answer in the court in the court for this question. Um, I was late, so if you um, prefer to discuss, um, I'm sorry for the question. Um, I wanted to ask, um, what's your opinion regarding uh, Dubois' opinion in Ziada, which basically canceled the ability, I think, of the court to um, decide that the settlement regularization law is invalid according to international law? So, yeah, so I was just saying that after I wrote the article, the other came after I wrote the article, I actually think that it fits perfectly into the CBIS because it basically, you know, is another example of the way the court is going to, which, which is to say international law, the relevance of international law is, is not very limited, okay? <laughs> Let's put it this way. Um, and if and since there are human rights issues at stake, then we will resolve them through Israeli Constitutional law. Um, so yeah, and, and Mr. Parkman said no, it still has to go. No, it still has to go in the argument. But I actually think that it strengthens the argument. It shows that this is indeed the direction um, the court is going to. What about the entire notion that eventually the Supreme Court is, to some extent, a political player in the Israeli society, and has to take into account two effects. One, its role and legitimacy in the Israeli society, which you referred to and said uh, uh, it has influence, but also its role with regard to protective as a shield between Israel and the international community. And there are decisions where the courts have said that, the judges have said that we are also uh, uh, some kind of a protective shield between Israeli and Israel international law. And therefore, you could say that when the court finds that it might be relevant, they refer more to international law because it helps to the adding the protecting shield. But when international law, international community won't have that much of effect on, on the situation, the court understands that, well, you have to deal within domestic law for your own legitimacy. I think, I think, it's, I think basically that's the question. Uh, because, and, and I think these are not two separate questions, they're the same question. When the court can do both, it can relative, relatively preserve legitimacy within Israeli society and at the same time, you know, uh, basically provide the shield 
from international criticism, that's what it does. And that's what basically Barack does in all of his movement, right? That's one of Barack's main pieces is saying, oh, we're actually protecting is the, the Israeli as well from international criticism by doing performing this judicial review ourselves under international law rather than leaving it to some judicial international body, which is why the ICJ opinion, ICJ's opinion is something that has to be responded to because it, it deals with the exact same question that the Israeli Supreme Court has already examined. So I think that um, when the court can do both, then you're right, that's what it does. The question is what happens when the court has to choose. What happened when what happened on these issues that are so contentious, so controversial within Israeli society that the court can't perform both functions and it has to choose on what side to be. And of course, the more contra politically controversial a question is, the more difficult it becomes to internally or an internal perspective, the more difficult it becomes for the court to perform both roles. And I think here House demolitions actually provide a good example because there's an international consensus against the House demolition. There's a strong international consensus that the House demolitions are illegal under international law. And at the same time, there is relatively strong support within Israeli society of the practice of House demolitions which means that it's likely that if the court applies international law to limit the state's action with regard to, to health demolitions, it will find itself attacked. And here in these situations, the court can't perform both functions. It has to choose. Now we've seen in other cases that, that are not that, that we deal with the, with the territories at all, that the court actually is attacked, right? When we look, for example, at the asylum, Seeker, asylum seeker cases, in which the court had to apply to refer to international law, it had no choice because there's simply no parallel, relevant parallel Israeli law that applies. Right? Some judges do try to turn to Israeli law, but they can't look at Israeli, at Israeli law without referring to international law because the question of the status of asylum seekers is really and in, in such an explicit international law question, in such an explicit way that it's almost impossible to take international law completely out of the discussion. And when the court applies international law through constitutional law, but applies international law to these cases, then we see the response, right? We see um, we see that it's being accused of preferring, I'm quoting from my memory, so I might not be accurate, of preferring universal human rights values over, you know, internal Zionistic interests. Right? I think the last, uh, last thing was that if Zionism was on the table, the court wouldn't have ruled the same way with regard to asylum seekers. So the clash in these questions, in these cases, is actually very clear. It's not that the court is not being accused. Now, there are some situations where the court can't avoid this clash. And there are other situations where the court has to make a choice whether to serve as a shield from international criticism, but expose itself to internal criticism, or to put its faith mostly in, within the domestic system. And I think that in the health demolition cases, the court prefers to stay within the internal sphere, within the internal discourse. But there could be other, other reasons. You could say, well, this is a lost cause on the international plane, so there's actually no point to it. You know, that, that's also, but that's, but that's the same kind of, that's already getting into what kind of consideration the court, um, court applies when it makes this decision, which crowd to turn to, the domestic or the international. Because you could say, well, when, I, when there is such a strong international consensus against a certain practice, we've already lost the international audience. There's no point in trying to convince the international audience that how the coalitions are legal under international law. So we might as well focus on our domestic you know, audience and, 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 and conduct a kind of internal domestic analysis. But that's already, I think, a little bit of speculation, right? A field of speculation. And then what about when you look at it as an external uh, point of view of the thing you're uh, trying to do? If you look at the increase value and development and then discretion of international law uh, within the state's decision makers prior to the decision. We've seen a very uh, significant increase 
of international law, within the Ministry of Justice, within the IDF, within uh, all other uh, ministries, which is taken into account, which could also be a reasoning for the decrease of taking international law into account uh, within the court's decision. I think that's true. I don't, I'm not sure. I think that's true in other branches. I'm not sure that's true with regard to the type of issues that arise here. I think that here actually the tendency within the other branches of the government is right is to uh, take the land planning, for example, the whole land planning section, right, which used to be separate land planning of, of the territories, is now part of the regular land planning uh, part within the ministry, within the Ministry of Justice. So the basically reorganizations. Internal reorganizations are going there are actually I think shifting towards this um, uh, this trend and bills proposed bills to apply uh, to, to automatically apply um, <coughs> certain rules certain laws to the territories are also another shift in this in this direction of um, of basically bringing territories into an, an, an internally Israeli discussion, making them more like Israel in terms of the laws that apply. So I think the shift in the other branches of the government are actually more so. There is a lot of um, attention given to international law in other areas, in areas of actually law of warfare, not so much law of occupation, I and mean, law of warfare, in areas of international, of international criminal law. There's a lot of issues which has to do with law, uh, translation of international law, the criminal aspects that are tied to international law of warfare. But that's different than the question of the territories. It's not about what you can or can't do in the territories. It's more about what you can and can't do during warfare. Their international law is still very strong. And I think that's also because that's not a problem <coughs> from Israeli to his course perspective as well. I don't think there's any real challenge internal challenge to the claim that the law that applies to warfare, to fighting, is international law. Not yet. While there is a real dispute whether the law that applies in the occupied territories on a day-to-day -day basis should be international law of occupation or should be treated as if it's part of Israel and apply Israeli law. Fighting law of warfare is a different question. Questions? If we have questions, no, we don't have questions online. Uh, I think. Thank you. And just before we're done. Uh,